Well, for the past uh, several weeks, we have been looking at the final words of Jesus to his disciples right before he is arrested and crucified. And one major uh, theme that we have seen so far is love. Uh, in the passage that Mark Warfel preached from last week, we saw that in verse 9 alone, love is mentioned three different times. Okay? It says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. But as we pick things up in verse 18 this morning, you're going to notice a little bit of a change. Take a look. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And so Jesus switches gears here, and he goes from an emphasis on love, especially the love of the Father, um, the love that Jesus has for his disciples and our need to abide in that love. He goes from talking about love to talking about hate, specifically the hate that the world has toward Jesus and to those who belong to him. As he goes on to explain in the very next verse, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. And so what Jesus is saying to his disciples is that the same kind of uh, separation that they saw while they were around Jesus, where some believed and others didn't, and where some kept his word and others wouldn't, where some became disciples and followed Jesus and others were just persecutors looking for a fight. Just as you saw people separate themselves around me, Jesus says, expect to see that same kind of response in your lives as well, because a servant is not greater than his master. In other words, you're not better than me. You're supposed to be like me, and if you are like me, then expect people to respond to you the same way that they responded to me. So that's nice, huh? We got that to look forward to. But that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It means that not everyone is going to like what you have to say. In fact, not only will there pe be people who don't like you, there will actually be those who hate you. Now, hate's a pretty strong word. Right? If you're a parent, it's what we typically tell our kids if they say they hate something. I hate vegetables or I hate blah, blah, blah. You know, hate's a strong word. But that's the word that you, uh, Jesus uses here in order to describe the reaction that the world will have to those who are disciples of Jesus. Now, when Jesus talks about the world, he's referring to something very specific. Um, and, and it's not the earth, and it's not everyone who lives on the earth. When Jesus talks about the world, he's talking about something else. And if we want to know what that something else is, all we have to do is go to the beginning of John's gospel and see how the world is introduced to us. If you look at John chapter 1, for instance, you'll see that John introduces Jesus to us as the word of God and the light of God. And so in verse 5, he describes Jesus specifically as the light that shines in the darkness. And then he says this in verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, that's Jesus, was coming into what? The world, right? And so the darkness that John talks about in verse 5, he identifies here as being the world. And so the world in, isn't introduced to us in a very positive way or even a neutral way. But it's literally the darkness that has set itself up in rebellion against God and against his son. And this rebellious spirit of the world has been around since, well, since Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the garden. And we've seen the hatred that that rebellion produces as far back as well, when Cain killed Abel. If you're familiar with that story, Cain killed his brother Abel not because Abel stole anything from his brother or hurt him in any way. Abel didn't 
call his brother's names or short sheet his bed or do something like that. He didn't treat his brother unfairly. But Cain hated his brother anyway, and he hated him not because Abel hated him too, but because Abel loved God. And so you think, well, why is that? Why, why would the fact that Abel loved God and worshiped God, why would that make his brother hate him so much? Well, you could ask the same question of the first disciples. Why would the world hate them so much? Why would they be persecuted? Jesus just got done telling them that, that people will know that they're his disciples by the way that they love one another. Well, what's so bad about that? If all we're about is love, loving God and loving one another, what exactly is there to hate about that? Now, I think we should probably say at this point that sometimes people hate Christians not because they love God too much, but because they're pious and self-righteous and proud, right? So there's that. But, you know, I think we could solve that problem real quick if we just preached the gospel more. And I don't mean to the world, I mean to ourselves, right? We need to preach the gospel to each other. We need to remind ourselves who we are, where we came from, and how it is that we got to where we are. And Jesus answers those questions and really sums up the whole gospel for us in one verse, right here in verse 19. Did you notice that? He says, you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. So where is it that we all came from? The world, right? And where are we now? Not of the world. Why? Jesus, right? And that's it. That's, that's the gospel in one sentence. I was in darkness. I was part of the problem. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and was by nature a child of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's me. Okay, that's, that's where I came from. And the only reason I'm not in that place anymore is because Jesus took me out of the world and gave me his life, eternal life, by grace, through faith. As Paul goes on to say in that chapter, not by works, so no one can boast. In other words, not by anything that I did, so I can't brag about it. So we can't be all religious and self-righteous and proud around people because the truth is we're no better than they are. We're just indescribably grateful recipients of the gift of God. Rebels who, by God's grace have been taken out of a world that continues to rebel against him. And therein lies the reason for the hatred. See, we used to be on the same team, following the course of the world together, but we're not anymore. And so part of the reason for this hatred, Jesus says, is because I chose you, because you're mine now and you're not a part of that team anymore. You're with me. So it's our relationship with Jesus that aggravates the world and brings about this hatred. But again, why? Right? I mean, if we're not actively uh, pointing the finger at people and judging people, and as we just pointed out, we shouldn't do that if we understand the gospel right. If our focus instead is on loving God and loving others as it should be, then where is all this hatred coming from? I think we get some insight into that question when we look at why it was that Cain hated Abel so much. See, Cain didn't kill Abel because Abel judged him and pointed out his faults and, and showed him what a lousy person he was. Abel didn't judge his brother's relationship with God. God did that. All Abel did was love God and love his brother. And that was enough to make Cain angry enough to kill him. But what is it about Abel's relationship with God that made his brother so angry? Genesis 4 tells us that Abel gave God the firstborn of his flock, 
Okay, and so as soon as Abel had something to give, he gave it to God. It was his number one priority. Cain, on the other hand, gave his offering, the Bible says, in the course of time. In other words, when he got around to it. When it was convenient for him to do so. And so the fact that Abel put God first and Cain put himself first became apparent to Cain after he saw how God accepted his brother's sacrifice and rejected his own. And now that Cain's sin has become evident to him, now that the reality of his selfish heart is made plain to him through the example of his brother, Cain is now without excuse. He knows he's in the wrong. He knows his brother loves God, and all he has to do is put God first like his brother does. Give God his best, right? Instead of focusing on taking care of himself. But instead, Cain kills his brother, even though he has no reason to and no justification to do it, he kills him anyway. Because he doesn't like how his brother makes him feel. Jesus gives us some insight into this as he goes on sharing with his disciples in verse 21. He says, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. Just as Cain killed Abel without cause, so will the world kill Jesus without cause. Because before Jesus came, we were in darkness. Right? And so, so we had difficulty seeing our sin. But since the word became flesh and the light came into the darkness and exposed our sin, well, now, now we have no excuse. Not that we weren't guilty before, right? But now that the invisible God has made himself visible not only in creation and not only through the Old Testament prophets, but now in the person and work of Jesus, now we really don't have an excuse. We've seen the Father reflected in the Son. And seeing that reflection reveals to us what we're really like. And, and when people see that, they will either embrace the truth and repent of their sin, or they'll hate the truth and they'll hide from their sin so that they don't have to think about it anymore. One story that I heard that um, I think illustrates this really well is... Uh, the story of a woman who uh, was part of a, a tribal unreached people group. And um, what had happened was she went uh, out of her village to um, visit this missionary. And she went to his hut. And this missionary um, had a mirror hanging from a tree. And uh, when this woman, who had never seen a mirror before, looked into the mirror that was on the tree and saw her own reflection, she must not have liked what she saw because immediately she jumps back and she says, who is that horrible person inside that tree? So the missionary, when he saw what, what, what happened, he's like, oh, no, no, no. The face that you see there, it, it's not the tree. It's not the tree's face. It's your own face that you're looking at. And so he took the mirror off the tree and he he handed it to her, and, and she looked at it, and um, when she was finally convinced that what the missionary was saying was true, she says to the missionary, I must have this glass. How much? And the missionary's like, well, it's not for sale, but the woman kept pressing the issue until finally the missionary gave her the mirror, and when the mirror was finally hers, the woman said, I will never have it make faces at me again. And she threw it on the ground and broke it to pieces. That's what Cain did to Abel. 
See, Abel was like a mirror that showed Cain what he was really like. And when Cain saw himself as he really was, rather than repent of his sin and change his ways, he broke his brother to pieces instead. So he wouldn't have to face it anymore. And that's how the world sees Jesus. Because Jesus is a reflection of God the Father. Whoever hates me, Jesus says in verse 23, hates my Father also. And, and so how we respond to Jesus is how we respond to God. To hate Jesus is to hate God, and to love Jesus is to love God. And when we as Christians live our lives in such a way as to demonstrate that love, we become an extension of that reflection. And the result, oftentimes, is persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so it's not a question of if, but when and to what degree. Now, not everyone is persecuted to the degree that those first disciples were, but that's not to say that that kind of persecution doesn't exist today, because it does. Over 360 million Christians around the world experience intense persecution for their faith. And that's just in the 50 countries where this stuff is documented. In those countries alone, we know of at least 5,600 and 21 Christians who were martyred, murdered last year, 2022. So these are current numbers. That's what's happening in the world now. Now, we're blessed to live in a country where we don't experience that level of persecution, at least not today. That doesn't mean that there's a, a lack of opposition to Christianity here in the States or even a lack of hatred for Jesus and those who follow Jesus, it just shows itself in different ways. And so when persecution shows itself, the question is, how are we supposed to respond to that? Do we relent? Do we retaliate? How should we respond? Well, Jesus gives us some insight into that beginning in verse 26. And when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So when the world hates us for being Christians, when they oppose us for what we believe, how should we respond? Well, Jesus tells us how we should respond right here. We respond with the spirit of truth and we respond with the word of truth. The spirit of truth, of course, is the Holy Spirit who is sent to us by Jesus from the Father to empower us to be witnesses for Jesus. And then there's the word of truth as well. Speaking to his disciples here, Jesus says in verse 27, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus is speaking to, directly to the 11 at this point because they're the ones who have been with Jesus from the beginning. And he's saying, look, you guys are also gonna bear witness because of your unique uh, situation of having been with me from the very beginning. And, and, and as we know now, part of the, ways that, part of the way that the, that the disciples accomplished that was by writing the New Testament. The Gospel of John that we're reading this morning, this is John's first-hand eyewitness account of the life of Jesus, what John himself witnessed from the very beginning. And so we have the witness of the Word of God, and we have the witness of the Spirit of God. Now, I think it's unfortunate that sometimes people feel like they need to choose between the two. You're either a, a Bible-believing Christian who um, relies upon the Word of God that, to lead you, right? Or you're a Spirit-led Christian who relies on the Spirit of God to lead, to lead you. I mean, it seems to me that Jesus never intended for us to choose, but that his plan from the very beginning was that we would embrace 
both the Spirit of God, who is an active witness for Jesus, and the Word of God, which is our foundation for understanding who Jesus really is. You see, what happens is this. When we embrace the Word of truth without the Spirit of truth, we risk having a relationship with a book instead of a person. Okay, our faith becomes more of an intellectual exercise with very little life or emotion behind it. But embrace the Spirit of God without the, without the Word of God and you run the risk of going off the rails, right? Replacing God's revelation of himself that we find in his Word with your own revelation of what you think God is like and with a faith that's based more on feelings and experiences than it is on the truth of God's Word. But when we embrace both the spirit of truth and the word of truth, then we have what we need to stand firm and to not fall away. As Jesus goes on to say in chapter 16 and verse 1, he says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. That's that delusion. And they will do things, these things, because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. I think it's funny that Jesus makes it a point here to tell his disciples, and I didn't say anything about all this persecution stuff when I first met you, right? But I'm telling you now so that when it does happen, you don't freak out and run away. Now, why do you think Jesus did that? Well, why did Jesus wait until now, right before he's about to be arrested and crucified, why did he wait until now to tell the disciples about the world hating them? Why not bring it up at the beginning? Let them know what they're signing up for. Well, because they didn't really know Jesus at the beginning, did they? It took the disciples three years to get to know Jesus and to see what he was really like and to develop a relationship with him. And the truth is, even now, they don't fully understand. But they know Jesus more now than they did when they first met him. And they also know how much Jesus loves them. We see that from the way that they, they react to the news that, that he's leaving. They don't want him to go. And, and I think that's, that's an important thing to point out as, as we finish up this morning. See, see, before the disciples could hear Jesus talk to them about how much the world would hate them, they first had to experience for themselves how much Jesus loved them. Because that's the relationship that should matter the most. Okay, if I, if I care more about what the world thinks of me, then I will do everything I can to preserve that relationship. Okay, if there's opposition, then I'm gonna try and mitigate that. Okay, I'm gonna watch what I say, I'm gonna make sure that I, that I don't offend anyone, even if it is the truth. I may even change my position on certain things, certain cultural or moral issues so I'm more accepted by the world. So they don't hate me so much. But see, if my relationship, if the relationship that matters to me most is my relationship with Jesus, then I'm not going to compromise my values or change what I believe because I care more about what Jesus thinks than what the world thinks. And he's already told me what following him is gonna look like, right? Not everyone's going to like it. In fact, a lot of people are going to hate it. But some of those very same people will one day believe. Not because we compromised. Not because we went soft on sin and made it easier for people to believe. But because the spirit of truth and the word of truth opened their eyes to the truth about God and the truth about themselves. And they responded to that truth, not by hiding from their sin and ignoring it, but they respond with repentance and faith that transforms their lives, just like 
it happen to us. See, see, how we respond to Jesus is the key to how we respond to the world with the truth of who God is and the truth of who he made us to be. And so as the worship team makes their, their way back up here,